Well, have you ever had a song going through your brain and you're not sure where it came from? It's just like there's a song going through your brain. And this morning I had that happening. I was sort of humming and maybe partially singing an old hymn, Victory in Jesus. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior. So I'm glad, and then I'm getting ready to go to church, and Sherry's there too. And, and Sherry says, why are you humming that song? Because she said, it was just going through my mind. I said, I'm humming that song because a little while ago, you were humming that song. And you know, humming is contagious. Have you ever noticed that? When you start, somebody else is singing a song, and all of a sudden it's stuck in your brain, and then it's just kind of there. And uh, I said, but what a fitting song for it to be stuck in our brains this morning because we're in a series called Victorious. You know, that, hymn, that hymn says, oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. And we're in this series. Uh, three messages ago, we talked about the fact that there's a very real spiritual battle. And God is victorious. The power of Jesus is victorious over the enemy. If you weren't here for the message a couple weeks ago on spiritual battles and God's victory, go online and watch that message. I don't say that very often, but go online and watch that message. It's, it's an important message to recognize. But Jesus wins victory over the enemy. And then on Good Friday, we talked about how there's moments where victory seems impossible. You know, when Jesus is hanging on the cross... When they thrust the spear into his side, he said, it's, he said, it's finished. And Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. He breathes his last. They thrust the spear into his side. The blood and the water come out. They bury him in the tomb. Man, victory seemed impossible. The victory that Jesus came to bring seemed over with. But then Easter Sunday, we celebrated the fact that Jesus Christ wins the victory. He conquers all. And today we're talking about what does it mean to walk in that victory? The journey of the victorious, because when we come to faith in Jesus, we receive his victory, and we walk in that victory every day of our lives. And I know that he's victorious. I know that God is still working. Let me tell you why. One of the reasons I know that God is still victorious and working is that last Sunday, 39 people put their faith in Jesus Christ and chose to walk in his victory. So praise God for that, right? Two, two of them were children that heard the gospel down in our children's area. And three of them are part of our Spanish-speaking community because as I'm preaching right now, we're translating into Spanish. And three of them were part of that group. And then the other 35 are just people who are part of Shoreline Church or friends or visitors who came. So God is still doing his work of victory. Someone say amen. amen. And he's still working. He's still victorious. And so, so now I, I began thinking about, okay, well, what does it look like for us then to walk that journey of being victorious, to walk with Jesus in his victory? And what, like, what is absolutely essential? What do you need to know? So for those 39 people that just put their faith in Jesus, what do they need to know to walk the journey of faith day by day and walk in the victory of Jesus? But what, what about if you didn't become a Christian seven days ago? What if you became a Christian 70 years ago? Say, I've been a Christian for 70 years. These five things I'm going to talk about are still things that are essential for you to walk in the victory. What's essential to walk in the victory? And as I thought about that idea of being essential, I thought of, I used to do a lot of backpacking and hiking and with my dad and with other people. And anytime we'd go on a hike or anytime we'd go backpacking, my dad would always say, you need to bring the 10 essentials. And there was a list of these 10 essentials that you don't go out hiking or backpacking without. And so I've got my little, my little day pack here. So you always had to bring extra cold weather clothing. So if you, maybe it starts out and it's nice and, and warm and it gets colder. You always brought a flashlight. And my dad would say, turn it on. Let's make sure it actually has batteries because that helps a flashlight work, right? And then, and then you had to have extra food. Oh, waterproof matches, right? And then you've got always... A compass. Well, I can use my GPS on my phone. It doesn't work in the middle of the Sierra Nevadas, right? <laughs> when you're on that kind of a hike. And it goes on. First aid kits. And, and there's a, a extra water. A, a, a knife. Water. All these things were things that every time we went hiking, we needed those essentials. You wouldn't go out without them. This morning at the 9 o'clock service, I looked in like in the second row from the front, indoors here in the worship center. Here's a, here's a family... And Jake Stroud, one of, one of uh, Sean Stroud, our, our executive pastor's sons, he went out on a three-hour hike, and he was gone for like 28 hours. They sent out search teams, and he could have died. I said, Jake, wouldn't you have liked to have had a backpack with this stuff in it when you went on the hike? He goes, yeah. <laughs> he's, kinda like, he's like, yeah, I, you know, there, there's basics you take if you're going to go out hiking. So if you're going to walk with Jesus in his victory, 
I'm going to give you today five essentials. Don't go out without them. Don't live a single day of your life without these five things. There's more that I could add to the list, but I want to look at five essentials. And if you're a note taker, write these down. If you have the Shoreline app, you can pull it up. It's also, there's notes on your sheet of paper there. Um, but on the Shoreline app, there's a place to fill these in. I want to walk you through five essentials that will help you walk in the victory of Jesus, whether you've been a Christian for seven days or 70 years. Here's number one. Essential number one, walking in the footsteps of Jesus. If you want to walk in victory, walk in the footsteps of Jesus. Let me put it a different way. Don't follow any other person. Don't follow a pastor, ultimately. Because this pastor, and every pastor I know, falls on their face occasionally. You can learn from us. We can walk in community together. But at the end of the day, you follow Jesus. Someone say amen. Right, don't, and, and then if a person messes up, your faith doesn't fall apart because it wasn't based on that pastor or that person or that musician or that Christian artist. It was based on Jesus. And that's where your faith should be based. And so walking in the footsteps of Jesus. So what's that mean? How do you walk in the footsteps of Jesus? Well, I remember some years ago, and some of you remember this too, people were wearing these armbands and these hats that said WWJD. And they were asking this question, what would Jesus do? And that was kind of a big thing for a while, but I actually want to suggest to you that asking yourself this question, what would Jesus do, is not the best question to ask. Because here's what happens when you ask that question, what would Jesus do? What do I think? What do I think Jesus would do? He'd probably do what I like. He'd probably do what I would do. When you're asking what would you, I knew non-Christians wearing a WWJD braces who'd never read the Bible. What would Jesus do? What do I, it became, what do I think Jesus would do? Well, that's not the point. So I have another, I have a, a replacement for WWJD. It's not as catchy, doesn't flow as well, but I think it's better. HDJL. Doesn't that just roll off the tongue? <laughs> HD, here's the question. How did Jesus live? How did Jesus live? That involves opening up this book and reading the story of Jesus. If you want to walk in victory, walk in the footsteps of Jesus. If you want to walk in the footsteps of Jesus, ask this question. How did Jesus live? How did Jesus love people, specifically from the Bible? Oh, I'll love them like that. How did Jesus serve people? Well, I'll serve them like Jesus did. How did Jesus forgive people? Ah, okay. I'll forgive the way Jesus did. How did Jesus pray? Yeah, Jesus prayed a lot. How did Jesus pray? I'll learn to pray like Jesus. I could have made prayer one of the five essentials, but actually, I'm doing a three-week series on prayer coming up called Big Prayers. And it's actually a three-week series on one chapter of the Bible, John 17. And John 17, it's the longest prayer of Jesus in all the Bible. The whole chapter is a prayer of Jesus. And we're going to take three weeks and learn from that big prayer of Jesus. But, but, but to say, how did Jesus pray? I'll pray like that. How did Jesus treat broken and hurting people? Oh, I'll treat them the way Jesus did. You following me? Not what would Jesus do, I'm going to kind of imagine in my mind and subjectively come up with what I think he would do. How did Jesus live according to the scriptures? And then I try to live like he lived. Listen to these words from Matthew chapter 4. Jesus is about to begin his public ministry, and he's calling people to follow him. And we read this in Matthew 4, beginning of verse 18. Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, and he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. I love this next verse. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. <laughs> That's what they did, right? They're just they're, they're doing what they did. They're normal, living their lives. Verse 19, come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. Jesus said, come follow me. You know what they did? They literally walked behind him. They walked in the footsteps of the rabbi. They went where he went. They learned what he did. And they tried to emulate Jesus. He said, come follow me. And it says, and they followed him. That's what, it, if you want to walk in victory, make sure you are walking in the footsteps of Jesus Christ. And you say, well, okay, then here's the question. How can I know the way of Jesus with greater clarity and conviction? How do I know how Jesus walked? How do I know how Jesus lived? If, if I'm going to say, what did Jesus do? How do I learn what Jesus did? Here's my, I'm going to give you three suggestions. They'll all help you. Here's the first one. Study the Gospels. There's four books in the Bible 
called the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They're all together at the beginning of the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Every one of them tells the story of Jesus. Now, it doesn't tell everything Jesus did. As a matter of fact, in the Gospel of John, he says, if everything Jesus did and taught were written down, and this is a hyperbole, but he says, the world itself couldn't contain all the books. The point is, there's a lot more that Jesus did. There's a lot more he taught. But this, but God gives us in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John sort of a snapshot, a simple description of all we need to know to walk in the ways of Jesus. And what I love about the Bible having Matthew, and I've had people say, why does the Bible have four? Why not just one gospel, one story of the life of Jesus? Why four? I look at it like this. I lived for years in Pasadena down in Southern California, and every year the Rose Parade happened there. Went right down Colorado Avenue and all these amazing floats. And I want you to imagine the Rose Parade's happening, and you know, a float's coming down the Rose Parade, and they're giving the commentary, uh, this float has 18,427 chrysanthemum uh, blossoms on it. This, it, has, it has 2 million 45 red petals. From, they're, they're describing the whole thing as it's going by, and there's all these moving parts and different stuff and people on the float. And as this float's going by, there's some, it goes through an intersection, okay, and it crosses Lake Avenue, or kind of where we lived, and, and there's a person, and after the float goes by, you ask somebody on this corner over here, and this corner, and this corner, and this corner, what did you see? when that float went by. Do you know that all of them would just describe it differently? Why? Different angles, different perspectives. Over on this side of the float, there were some things happening that weren't happening over here. So they each, they're all describing the same thing, but they describe it from their vantage point, from their perspective. But when you get those four kind of testimonies or perspectives together, you got the whole picture. That's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They all tell the story of Jesus. You got to get to know all four of these books. And you've got to look at Jesus and say, how did he love? How did he serve? How did he deal with conflict? And then you try to live out the way of Jesus. You walk in that victorious life by following the example of Jesus. So these four different perspectives all bring a fresh outlook. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, I love the four Gospels. Matthew, his kind of, each one has kind of their own perspective. Matthew's perspective is this. He's looking at the Old Testament and all the prophecies and how Jesus fulfilled them. So Matthew says things like, and this happened to fulfill what was written by this prophet. And this happened, and he gives lots of connections to the Old Testament, to the prophecies. Mark's unique thing, you know how you know some people that you're talking to them and, and they go, and this and this happened, and, 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 and then this, and then this, and they like go really quickly and jump from thing to thing to thing. That's Mark. Shortest gospel. He uses the word immediately, and immediately this happened, and then this happened, and then immediately it was this. And, he's, he, and he gives like the cliff notes, quickest walk through the Gospels. But it's a unique perspective from where he's looking. Luke was a physician, very analytical. Luke includes more parables of Jesus than the other Gospels. Luke breaks things down and kind of lays his story from Luke to the book of Acts of kind of the whole story of Jesus in the early church from, from a very more analytical perspective. And John, he's, his perspective is kind of like a theologian. He, he, he tells the narrative stories of Jesus' teaching, miracles, and then here's what it means. Here's, here, so you can understand deep, the deep theology of what's being taught. But if you look at it from all four corners of the street, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and put them all together, you get this picture of the life of Jesus. So if you want to walk in the victorious journey of following Jesus, you got to know how he walked, how he lived. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John get to know them. I say, well, I've read those before. Yeah, so have I. Lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of times. But every time I read them, every time, God shows me something new. Just open. You ever had that? You, you, I read that a thousand times. I never saw that. That's the Holy Spirit giving you something new. Keep reading the Gospels. So then, the second thing, study the Gospels, number one. If you want to walk in this victorious path of Jesus and you want to learn how Jesus lived, walk in his, uh, first read the, read the Gospels, then walk in his footsteps again and again and again. If you want to learn to walk the victorious journey of Jesus, follow him, read what, you know, how did he live, follow his example. Here's what, here's what it's like following Jesus, at least for me. And I'm a pastor and I'm very serious about my faith. I go like, okay, here's where Jesus wants me to go. I'm following him. I'm walking his footsteps. I know right where he wants me to go, and I'm really focused, and I'm doing a great job. And all of a sudden, I go, whoa, I'm way over here. I got to get back on the path. Follow, okay, got to follow him again. And, follow, and I wander over this way, and I get distracted. Am I the only one? Thank you. Okay, I mean, and if you didn't say no, please. Um, <laughs> seriously. I mean, it's, it's following Jesus is a challenge. It's hard, right? And so, so just keep, so you say, well, I kind of wandered off. Then Start again. Get back on the path. You're not back at square one. 
You know, you, I've been walking with Jesus for two years now, and I'm wondering, okay, Beck, I'm still here, but I just got to get back on the path. Understand that God's grace is, is amazing. And if you wander off the path a little bit, just get back on. Keep following Jesus. So read the Gospels. Keep walking in his footsteps again and again. Know his grace. And then, I think this is so important, watching those who have followed Jesus faithfully for many years. We don't build our lives on any other person, any pastor, any Christian musician. We don't base our lives or our faith on anybody except for Jesus. But we can learn from the examples of godly people. So here's what you do. You look around your life. You look around the people you know, and you find people who really, for years, have modeled following Jesus. And you learn from them. You pay attention to them. When I was a young Christian, uh, there was a guy, John Byron. He was, the, he was a youth pastor at the church where I became a Christian. And John Byron loved the Bible. And he read the Bible, and he studied it every day, and he talked about the Bible a lot. And I started watching him and learning. I still have ways that I read, read the Bible day by day that were influenced by John Byron over 40 years ago. Because he was a good example. Because Jesus loved the Scriptures. And this guy, John, showed me how an ordinary person, and someday a person, I did, a person became a pastor, could really love the Scriptures. So I, I learned from him. Grandma Lois. Grandma Lois is with Jesus now. But Grandma Lois, our church, our church in Michigan... Years ago when I came to that church, there was this woman there named Grandma Lois. She was always Grandma Lois. And she was always, she always was a little bit older, and she was about, about this tall. And she was the mo- one of the most warm, greeting people you'd ever meet. So every person who walked into that church, she, if she knew you, she'd say, she, she saw, if she saw you, Rick, she'd go, Rick! And she'd come right at you and come in for a hug. And she'd hug you right about down here. You know, she'd come right in there, a little low hug. She'd grab you, give you a hug. Then she'd go, I gotta go, I gotta greet somebody else. And she's off to greet the next person. If you were new at the church. She knew it because she greeted everybody every week. And if she saw you were new, I, I, would, I would refer to it as, as a very slow-moving, heat-seeking missile. Okay? <laughs> so she would see somebody and she'd see them and they were new. I'm going to look at Greta over here. So if you were new, she'd just start coming towards you as fast as she could. But, and then when she got close, the arms would come up. She's coming in for a hug. She hadn't met you, but she's coming in for a hug and you couldn't stop her. That was Grandma Lois. I learned how to love people and pay attention to new people that maybe feel awkward and out of place from watching her. So you become like Jesus also by watching people who are living it really well. There's a guy named John Shaw. He was a retired pastor. He'd been retired for almost 20 years. And he, he came on our staff as just to visit our shut-in people, people that were homebound and shut-ins. He would visit them, bring them communion, visit with them, care for them. Great guy. And John was this, this prayer warrior. I learned to pray so much from just listening. I, I, I wanted to learn to pray like John Shaw prayed because he just loved Jesus. And about once a month, uh, on a Sunday morning, maybe an hour, hour and a half before the service started, I'd be in my office at my desk just kind of praying and going through my notes and preparing to bring the message. And he always knew I'd be in my office a little bit early before we started getting things ready in the worship center. So when he'd come to the church, he'd walk into my office. He would never knock. John, it was, it was John Shaw, he wouldn't, he'd just come to my office. He'd open the door. He wouldn't say a word. He'd walk around behind my desk. I'm sitting there, and I knew, I knew it was going to happen. He'd walk around behind my desk. He'd come behind me. He'd put his hands on my shoulders, and he would just start to pray for me. And every time he prayed for me, I wept. I'm not a big crier. I'm not. But he would begin to pray, and it was like the power of heaven and the Holy Spirit would come on me. And he'd finish and he'd walk out, wouldn't say a word, walk out and close the door. And I'm sitting there thinking, I'm glad I got an hour till I preach because I'm all snotty and I'm all, you know, I'm like, and I got to pull myself back together and get, get ready to preach. But, but I remember just thinking, I would love that if I prayed for people and the Spirit of God came with that kind of power. John Shaw wasn't Jesus. I didn't follow him ultimately or worship him, but I learned from watching his life. You following me? If you want to walk in the victory of Jesus and walk that journey with victory, the first essential is this. You've got to know how Jesus lived and you've got to follow his example. If you don't get that one right, the next four don't matter. You've got to get that one right, okay? Number two, essential number two, striving for holiness. Striving for holiness. Or what I'm going to start calling, and I got this actually from my son Nate. I don't know if he got it from someone else or he came up with it, but living modern Amish. Modern Amish. I I love that term. Holiness, a holiness is a decision to live a life that is set apart and looks different than the world. And too many of us as Christians look exactly like the rest of the world. 
But if you, want, if you want to walk in the victorious journey of Jesus, you've got to learn to walk in holiness, and that means you're going to look different. You're going to look different than the rest of the world. Listen to these words from 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 13. 1 Peter 1, 13 and following says this, Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. As obedient children... This is for every Christian. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in arrogance, when you you lived in ignorance. Don't live the way you used to live. Here's verse 15. But just as he, God, just as he who called you is holy, so you be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. That's God speaking. That's a quote from Leviticus 11.44 where God says, be holy for I, the Lord your God, am holy. So what does holy mean? Perfection? No. Holiness is this, striving to be more and more like God, to follow him in his ways, which means you will look different than the world. Jesus looked different than the world. They killed him for it. Jesus looked different than the world. He lived differently. To be separate and set apart. To be in the world, but not of the world. And to understand there's an all-out attack in our world on holiness. But Christians still seek to walk in the ways of Jesus. So we look and we love and we live differently than the world. Listen closely. I'm not saying we judge and point a finger at people and shake our, oh, it's not this kind of thing. Oh, you're so bad, I'm so good. No. It's just you follow Jesus so closely that, that you, you look different. The, the Amish have kind of come to their conclusion that they will just simply pull out of the world and that's how they'll be different. The idea of being modern Amish is saying, I'll still live in the world, but I'll still be different. And that's more cha- I think it's more challenging to live in the world and be different than to go and live outside the world. That seems a little easier, but I think we have to walk this challenge. So, so here's what it looks like. People you're talking to and they're gossiping about someone else. They're talking about somebody else. You don't enter in. I mean, your mouth shuts. You don't do that. Maybe you even remove yourself from that situation, kind of pull out of it because you're, I can't be, if I'm standing there listening, I'm kind of part of it. You look different. You're set apart. But that's what Christians do. How you view sexuality in our world. Our world keeps redefining sexuality about right now about every six months or a year. It's like, this is okay, this is okay, this is different, this is different. And, and, it's, and I can tell you, I, I'm not prophetic, but I'm predicting that will keep happening even at a rapider pace as we go forward. But Christians say, I love people, I'm gracious, I'm kind, but I don't believe that's the way God wants us to live. And we stand our ground. We don't smack people over the head and we don't wave a finger, but we live the way we live. And if somebody asks us what we believe, we tell them what we believe. With kindness and grace, we say, but this is what I believe. It's what I've always believed. It's what the Bible's always taught. You're going to look different. You're going to be set apart. You're in the world, but not of the world. How we use our time. Do, do, you use, do you use your time like everybody else uses their time? There's people that spend 20, 30 hours a week consuming streaming video and media, binge-watching shows. 20, 30 hours a week, every evening from 6 o'clock till 10 o'clock, 11, 12 o'clock, just sitting and watching stuff. Does, does your life look any different? What if you took half that time and went out and served the poor and helped people in need? Open up your Bible. Talk to friends and encourage them and just try to build them up and support them. You could change the world with that time. Do we look exactly the same or do we look different? Are we set apart? Are we holy? How you use your words. Do your words encourage and bless other people? Because that would make you look different. So why are you always so positive? Why are you always so encouraging? Because that's who I am. If you want to follow in the path of Jesus, it means growing in holiness, being set apart. So here's the question. What's my next step to live and walk in holiness? What's, what's my next step? What's something i got to stop doing or start doing? And please, don't, don't like put a trumpet and say, doo, 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 look what I'm doing, look what I stopped. That's not the point. Live your life. But live differently. People will notice. People will ask you, why don't you do, you don't do that anymore? Why do you live, why do you, why are you living that way? They're going to ask you. They will. And at that point, you can share with them, which will also make you set, a, set apart for Jesus. Essential number three, traveling in community, reconnecting, reengaging. We are made for community. And you, if you travel that journey alone, it's always dangerous. Travel the, the journey of Jesus with God's people, with the church, with Christian friends. 
Man, reconnect in our youth ministry, our children's ministry. As of today, I think we're, we've got children's ministry from preschool through fifth grade. We have middle school ministry going and high school ministry going now. We don't have the toddlers, I mean, we don't have the, like the nursery yet, but as soon as we can, we're going to get that going too. But, but reconnect with people. If you're still at home when you're ready, reconnect. Start in the parking lot if you need to. Move into the courtyard when you're ready. Move inside when you're ready. We're going to keep doing lots of things to make sure we meet everybody where they're at, but I believe we need to be together and get this concept. See each other's faces, <laughs> right? There's a couple this morning I saw at the 9 o'clock service that had a little baby, and I was saying hi to the couple, and I said, I said I'm just going to take a step back, and I, and I pulled my mask down, and I said, I said to the little baby, I said, this is what I look like. <laughs> Because there's this mask. And I, and I actually said to them, I said, what a sad thing. They actually said, yeah, our child's grown up so most of their life not seeing people's faces. You know, when you see a baby, how you always smile. You know, hey, sweetie, I, even if you don't know him, you just need one. That's what they need to see. They're seeing a mask. And as soon as we can start to reconnect and, and, and live as people were designed, to, and yes, keep being, we've been very careful about all the safety stuff. I'm not against that at all. But when you can, so in that case, I stepped back past six feet and I looked and I said, hey, baby, this is, and I smiled as big as I could. This is what the face looks like, right? Um, we got to reconnect. And so how do, you, how do you, here's the question. What's my next step to reconnect and re-engage with the family of God? How do I reconnect in the body of Christ? Here's some ideas. First, just value the importance of being together. We've gotten used to being apart. That shouldn't be normal. Re-engage and be, say, I want to value being with life to life with people. Reconnect and serving. Many of you at home, many of you in the courtyard, in your cars, in the past you've served, in our community, in our church, but man, for right now, the last year, it's like pull back. Man, the there's organizations in the community you used to be a part of that need you to go back and volunteer in our community. They need you there. There's ministries here. We can't reopen our, we can't op reopen our nur kids' nursery without people who are ready to come and help. We need people to volunteer. So when you're ready, re-engage in serving, and that will reconnect you in the community of God. Re-engage in giving. For many of you, COVID's been a tough time financially, but when you're ready, start giving again. What happened, I love, I love Rick, I, I can't want to say Pastor Rick, because Rick, you're, Dr. Rick, but you got kind of a pastor's heart. But, but when Rick was talking about all that happens here, we, the, first or the last quarter of last year, I said, last quarter of last year, over 10,000 people we served, right? Out of the, over 10,000 people out of the food pantry. They were served because you've been generous, you come and volunteer, you're part of that. That's 10,000 people over three months right here in our own parking lot. There's needs what's your place? Maybe it's serving up with children's ministry, youth ministry, um, whatever it is, re-engage, reconnect. And then uh, just, just understand that we're going to walk with you along this journey. There's going to be some people that aren't ready to re-engage and reconnect and they're going to move back slower. That's okay. We love you where you're at. We'll be patient. But, but as your pastor, can I let you know, I'm going to keep, just like I challenge you to read your Bible, to pray, to grow spiritually, I'm going to keep challenging you to reconnect in the community of God's family because that's an essential it's essential for a healthy journey, a victorious journey. Essential number four. Just understand that our light for the path is the Bible. Our light for the path in front of us, where we're going to walk, how we're going to live, how we're going to love, this is our light for the path. And we need to open this book and read it every day. If you are a follower of Jesus, reading this book is essential for a victorious Christian life. And then aligning your life with what it teaches you. Not taking the parts you don't like and kind of tossing them out, but saying, oh, i got to get my life to fit with this book, not to make this book fit with my desires. If you'll do that, you will walk a victorious life. Psalm 119, the longest chapter of the whole Bible, almost in the very middle of your Bible. Psalm 119 says this, beginning of verse 103. That's how you know it's a long chapter. It has more than 100 verses. In verse 103, how sweet are your words to my, to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. I gain understanding from your precepts. Therefore, I hate every wrong path. Your word is a lamp for my feet, a light on my path. There is sweetness in this book. Sometimes you read this book and, and, and you're walking the path. You go, I'm doing a pretty good job. And you read this and it says, oh, by the way, that's a wrong path. You go, oh, I got to stay off that one. Or I'm on it. I better get off this. I mean, it shows us the right way to walk, but it also says that's the wrong path. If you want to walk a victorious journey, you got to know what path to walk on. This book shows you the right paths and the wrong paths. So immerse yourself in this book. So here's my question. How can I engage deeply in the scriptures to help illuminate my path? How do I dig into this book? And I'll give you a couple suggestions. One, we create a daily reading guide. 
for every week of the year, 52 weeks a year. It's on the Shoreline app, which is a free app. It's on the Shoreline website. When we had bulletins in the past, if we haven't in the future, it'll be on there. We give seven days of Bible reading. It's only about five to 10 minutes of Bible reading for each day. But if you, will re- if you read that, here's an amazing thing. If you read, if you started that today and you read the next seven days, the passage that we have assigned for you, here's what's going to happen. You'll be totally ready for next Sunday's sermon. This is why. Because every passage prepared for this week is to prepare you for next Sunday's sermon. Is it coincidence? I think not. We planned this. <laughs> we want to help you grow in the word. If, 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 if you don't want to do that, we have a 50-day reading plan back at our Connection Center. You can go back and say to Patty, can I get one of those 50-day reading plans? We give that to people who don't know the Bible very well, and they want to kind of do a, a primer, a beginning, first walk through, introdu- kind of introduction to the Bible. Here's 50 days of reading, and that plan will walk you through that. We, I believe we have that in English and in Spanish, so that's available to you, all right? So that's another option. Uh, and then also, I would just say, get into a Bible study. Our precept on precept is doing, I asked Barb in the middle of the sermon this last message, they're going through the book of Jeremiah together. We have men's Bible studies, women's Bible studies, couples Bible studies, young people's Bible studies. We have youth and Bible studies. We want to study God's word. If you want to get to know this book and let that light shine in your path, you got to read it. You got to dig in. And if you're not sure where to start even with all that, call the church. We'll have you meet with a pastor or a leader and we'll personally help you to design a plan for you to read the Bible. We, it's that important. We take it that seriously. And essential number five, this is the last one. And again, there's more I could share, but this is the last one I want to share today. Know how to get back up and follow Jesus again and again and again. If you want to walk a victorious journey with Jesus, you have to learn to get back up. Why? Because we all stumble. We all fall. No matter how much you love Jesus, no matter how much you walk in the power of the Holy Spirit, no matter how much you know his grace and forgiveness, there's moments where you just trip and land on your face. And at that point, you got to pop back up, get on your feet and say, Jesus, I'm still following. I love how Peter, the apostle Peter, you know, when, when he, when Jesus was talking about how there's going to come a day when all of the disciples will betray Jesus, he says, all of you will turn for me. All of you are going to run, run for the hills when the times get tough. And Peter says, I'll never betray you. That won't happen to me. And Jesus says, before the, the, the cock crows three times, you're going to deny me. And then the pressure's on. And Jesus has been arrested. And the crowds have turned mean. And Peter's following to see what happens to Jesus. And somebody says, hey, you're one of his followers. And you know what Peter says? I don't know what you're talking about. If you read all four Gospels and put them in four corners, of the, you read all four, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you look at it, here's what basically happens. Peter says, I don't know what you're talking about. A little bit later, somebody else says, no, you're one, of, you're one of his disciples. You have an accent. You're, you're one of them. And the second time he says this, I swear I don't know Jesus. This is Peter, one of his closest friends. A little bit later, one, another person comes and says, no, I'm sure you're with him. You were one of those disciples. And here's what Peter says. May I be cursed if I know him. I don't know the man. I swear I don't know him. The Bible says at that moment, Jesus, turned and, Jesus heard it and saw it, turned and looked at him, their eyes met. And the Bible says, Peter went out and wept bitterly. He fell on his face. And we all do at times. And when Jesus rose from the dead, he shows up at the Sea of Galilee and Peter's there. And sitting by a fire, having, some, having a fish lunch, <laughs> Jesus says to Peter, Peter, do you love me? Peter says, you know I love you. He asked him three times, do you love me? Do you love me? His denial, denial, denial. He got to affirm, affirm, affirm. And you know what Jesus said to him every time he affirmed that he loved him? Jesus said something like this, feed my sheep, tend my lambs, get back to work, keep serving. <laughs> Extra water if you need it. He said, he said keep, he, 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 he just said, you feed my sheep, you tend my lambs, keep serving me. You know, Peter felt totally unworthy. How could Jesus ever use me again? And I love this. When Jesus first met Peter, we read it earlier, he said, follow me. So now after Peter's fallen on his face, Jesus says, get back up. Remember that you love me. Get back to work. And the last thing Jesus says is this. Peter, you follow me. If you're going to walk the, the, the journey of the victorious, when you fall on your face, when you mess up spiritually, You know that he's already forgiven you. He loves you. You confess it to Jesus. You say, give me power. And he will pick you up like like the loving one he is. And he'll dust you off. And he'll say, you're still my girl. You're still my boy. I love you. Let's get going. Keep following me. You say, well, you don't don't understand, Pastor. I've fallen down like 87 times in the same area. I don't know if I can get back up again. He'll pick you back up. Ask him to. He'll pick you back up again. 
They'll dust you off. And they'll say, let's keep walking the victorious Christian life. You mean I'm victorious even if I've fallen 87 times and i got to get up again? Yeah, the victory is you got back up again. You kept following. And he leads you every step of the way. Jesus, this is our prayer today. That we would walk this victorious Christian life we would immerse ourselves in your word. We would, we would stay in your footsteps, Jesus. We would so know how you lived and how you loved and how you served. We'd be so in love with how we meet you in the scriptures and we have such a clear picture of you that we become more and more like you. Lord, that we would look at other people who are good examples and learn from them, but not follow them. We follow you, Jesus. But we can learn from others. That we'd immerse ourselves in the scriptures. That we would walk in community as your people. And Jesus, when we fall, and maybe some right now who are listening, they're kind of feeling like they're flat on their face and they've turned their back on you, they've done something, they've denied you, kind of like Peter did. But may they hear you say, follow me, get back up. This journey's not over. You can still walk in the victory of my resurrection. Jesus, may our lives be an adventure of walking with you until we see you face to face. We pray this in your name and for your glory. And everyone said? Amen. 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 I want to give you a couple of words uh, before I send you off with a blessing. And so first, I want to let you know, if you you became a believer uh, this last week or in the last 10 or 20 years and you've never been baptized... We want, we're going we're to have a time next Sunday at 1 o'clock. Pastor Roy will be having an informational class about baptism. You can go online and register. You can go back and see Patty. And get, or who's back there? I see Maggie, Patty. I don't know who's back there. But go back and register back there if you want to. Or just call us during the week at the church and just say, hey, uh, I want to register. I want to learn about baptism. And that's happening at 1 o'clock here on campus uh, this next week. If you want to be baptized and you're not on campus yet, call us and we'll figure out something for you who are at home. If you need prayer for anything, Pastor Dennis is right at the top of the stairs at his usual outdoor prayer space and a whole team of people ready to pray with you. So please head right up there for prayer. If you're online, you're going to see a phone number right there and you can call that number and there's live people ready to pray with you or you can send a text to the text uh, address and we'll pray for you through the week as a staff and as a team. We have a whole prayer team that prays every week for those people that send a note in. And if you're new today at Shoreline, if you're online and you're new, just text the word welcome to the, to the number you see on the screen, and we will send you a digital get to know you card, and we'll start a process of getting to know you better until you're ready to come join us here. We want to get to know you right where you're at. And if you're on campus in your car or in the courtyard and you're new and you've never done so, go by the Connection Center. They got a little ba- a gift bag they want to give you, and they want to give you a warm personal welcome and thank you for coming and answer your questions about the church. And also, I will tell you the last thing before I have you stand. Um, the, uh, we open our church offices starting tomorrow. And so we've had the offices been closed. They will be open and we'll be functioning as normally as we can with the stuff we're dealing with. We have a few protocols, but as normally as we can. So feel free to come by and visit us. And if you came with, and wanted to give offering, you noticed during the, the song, offering song, we didn't pass a plate. We're not ready for that yet. But at the exit, the very exit, there's a nice green post with a, a, a mailbox and it says offering. You can put your offering right there if you feel like you'd like to do that. So would you stand with me and let me send you off with a word of blessing. Jesus Christ has won the victory. He rules, he reigns, and he's Lord of all. So walk in the power of his victory every day of your life. Walk the journey of the victorious. And when you stumble, get back up. Keep on walking. Because he's with you and he loves you and his grace is always enough. God bless you. Have a great week and we'll see you right back here to continue talking about the victory of Jesus next Sunday. Have a great week. God bless you. God has made us for community. We need each other. We need the joy of fellowship. We need accountability with each other. We need the inspiration we get from one another. And like a sports team, where only one person is trying to do all the work, you never win. We can be inspired, encouraged, fall in love with God, with each other, and then go out to make a difference in the world. We are better together. Being a part of the Food Pantry team makes me feel great. It just fills me with joy. I, I can't tell you enough how blessed I am. And when we do come together and work together, we feel the love of family, and we feel the support and the joy. And there are people there to laugh with us, to weep with us, to pray with us, to eat with us. 
and it just, uh, it, it's a community and it's really important. I think we were created to be with community. It's much better to go through motherhood with other mothers in community because that's the way God wants us to live our lives, is together in community. I don't have to go through it alone. The small group keeps me attached. The people in it are very caring. We care about them. We pray for each other. Um, when we don't have the small group, I really feel lonely for the group. I miss them. We are made and designed for community, and so, Getting involved not only benefits those around you, but it really allows you to connect on a deeper level to the Lord. Being on the worship team and a part of the Shoreline community is truly the first time I have felt like I fit in and I belong and I have a place that's valued and important. Together, life is better. Together, we can make a difference. Together, we are family. Together, we are better. Together, we are the church.